Thank you so much. Um, this is, I hope everybody can see my screen and there'll be a little bit of audio. I show this image because it's the blue marble. It's the second catalog image of our planet. Um, it was taken um, December 24th, uh, 1970. And uh, it's the second catalog image of our planet. Most climate speakers and activists show you this to show you that there's no nations, no borders that we're all on the same planet, all moving in the same direction. But I show it to you for two different reasons. I show it to you, one, um, because I'd like you to feel a part of our planet as not just a passenger or, or along for the ride, but actually as a co-pilot, as a crew member, as somebody who is steering the future of our planet as what we call symbiotic earth or as homo symbios of our planet and the second reason i show you this is because why do you think we have this image if you look on the bottom left corner of this image you can see it's from nasa and that gives you a little bit of hint because without innovation emerging technologies we would not have this image this is pure innovation. It is the lifeblood, the satellites, the emerging technologies, the computing power that took us to the moon and brought us safely back down to Earth is innovation. It's pure innovation that uh, gives us the heartbeat, the lifeblood, up to the date, information accurate to the minute of what's going on on our planet. Had it not been through these emerging technologies and innovation and we sending someone to the moon in the form of a moonshot, which, which is we celebrated 51 years ago in December, landing someone on the moon, we would not have this image and know what's going on on our planet. And so I would like to tell you a little story, a couple of stories actually about this this gentleman. This is Dr. Bertrand Picard. He is the owner of uh, Solar Impulse and 1000 Solutions. He's the first man to fly around the world in a solar airplane. And this photo was uh, of me and him taken at COP24 uh, in Katowice, Poland. Uh, COP is the uh, climate conference for the United Nations and we see each other quite often at these climate conferences uh, as well as at the World Economic Forum in, in Davos and uh, I'd seen him after he got off his solar impulse flight around the world and I asked him I said well first I said congratulations you did it that amazing feat how was it? Tell me about it. Uh, what did you learn? What was your experience? What was the biggest takeaway? And he said, Mark, have you ever ridden in an all electric vehicle? And I said, sure. Yeah. About a week ago, I was in Italy and, and rode in one of these first electric uh, smart cars and, and it was fabulous. It was totally silent, kind of a surreal experience. He said, imagine that times a thousand. I'm up in solar impulse and it's like a big glider. It's like a thousand times lighter than the most aerodynamic and performance plus glider and it's soundproof. And what we do is we climb to the highest altitudes that we can. Then we turn off the motors and, and the propellers and we do a long gradual glide to let the solar cells charge. He said, I was in the middle of my glide, maybe 15 minutes, or not even in the middle, and about 15 minutes into his glide, and he said he looked off to the left at the solar panels on the wings. He looked off to the right to the solar panels on the wings. He looked at all his instrumentation inside his cockpit and his suit, and he was sitting on a toilet and had all this gadgetry and instrumentation around him. 
and it was totally silent. It was so soundproof. And he said, I'm a rocket man. I'm from the future. I'm in the future. And he was kind of euphoric and having this really kind of a weird moment. About another 15 minutes went by and he looked around again, total silence. He didn't have anything more to do. He'd done all his logs. He'd done all his recording. And he thought, no, I'm living in the now. Everybody else is living in the past. All this instrumentation, solar cells, panels, airplanes, propellers, batteries, uh, electricity, this has all existed for a long time. I'm just the first to put it all together and to make it work in a much different way as part of the clean tech revolution. His other company is called 1000 Solutions and 1000 Solutions is a company that uh, solves global grand challenges um, through entrepreneurs and innovations and he supports those with funding and monies so that they can get what they need. I want to show you a little video that he did right out while he was on his flight around the world where he speaks to Ban Ki-moon at the United Nations at the signing of the Paris Agreement. Hello, Solar Pulse. Hello, Captain Picard. Where are you now flying? I, I speak to you from the cockpit of Solar Impulse in the middle of the Pacific, flying on solar power, only, no fuel. You know, Mr. Secretary General, what you are doing today in New York, signing the Paris Climate Agreement, is more than protecting the environment. It is the launch of the clean technology revolution. But there is so much resistance everywhere. So be pioneers, be adventurers, be explorers of the solutions of today. This is how we can make a better world. Don't let the resistance take over because we have the solutions. And if an airplane can come, like Solar Impulse, can fly day and night without fuel, the world, of course, can be much cleaner. I am inspired by your pioneering spirit. And uh, we are, while you are making history, we have also made the history today. Uh, more than 175 countries signed the climate change agreement. And I'm... <laughs> thank you for your leadership and inspiration. And I thank you very much. All the best to you. Bon voyage. So just so that there's no mistake, I want you to know, and I'm going to repeat it, that this is the world's first ever global moonshot. I want you to know that more than 175 countries came together. It was 197 countries came together, agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals, and signed the Paris Agreement. It is the biggest people, planet, protection, and peace plan the world has ever seen. It's uh, the last moonshot where the world came together uh, or where people came together to do a moonshot in this respect was 51 years ago when we put someone on the moon. And it was just a handful of people from the United States, uh, not more than a couple thousand, and a few different country participants. I want you to know that for two countries to come together and agree upon where they're going to go to lunch, let alone on a insurance and protection plan for our world is unprecedented. It's a historical event that has never occurred before. This happened in 2015. And the reason I bring that up to you is it's a roadmap and a goal, a plan, a layout, the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so now they, they occurred in 2015 and uh, that's when we signed the agreement and 
I'm just going to stop sharing so that you can see me again and exit out. Perfect. And now I kind of want to get into a discussion with you after I've shown you a little bit of background. This happened in 2015. We're in 2020 now, five years away from the Paris Agreement. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And um, I want you to know what we're seeing around the world. We're seeing people waiting for bailouts, waiting for governments, waiting for communities, waiting for someone to bring the future to them, to bring infrastructure, to bring resilience, to bring support to them. We're not playing an active part as team members, as crew members on the spaceship Earth to guide the future where we want. We're kind of waiting for it to happen for us. We're waiting for a bailout. We're waiting for uh, certain governments to help us. The problem is um, we're feeling this turmoil all over the world right now and this kind of unrest that the current civilization framework models around the world, US, Europe, Germany, China, Japan, doesn't matter where we're at, whether it's the Bolsonaro's, the Trump's, the Shays, the Duarte's or Erdogan's, the current civilization frameworks are no longer working for all of us. And so I wanna start out with a, a question. What does a world that works for everyone look like to you? What are you waiting for to make the world that you want happen for you. So um, the reason I bring up the, the, the sustainable development goals in the beginning is because we've had five years of a pretty solid plan of action, a roadmap, goals, targets, and indicators, the Paris Agreement, that could solve a lot of the problems we're facing as a global world. What most people don't understand is that is uh, something that requires, and it's kind of an underlying tone that most people do, aren't aware of, but the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement require a global economic change. They require zero poverty, zero hunger, quality education, gender equality, and many, many other things that are basically a framework of change, a new civilization infrastructure model for the entire world. That's why it was important that, the, that it was ratified, that more than 175 countries got on board and signed that agreement. And so now we have this plan but many of us are like, ah, uh, you know, we just, we're in this middle of this pandemic and we're waiting for the government bailout. Or we're in a city that we're waiting for infrastructure for clean water and sanitation, food. We're always waiting on someone else. We need to tar start taking an active role as individuals to, to change that model. And, and how do we do that? Where do we find the help? Where do we find the support? Do we, are we on that belief? Can we unify it as a planet to do this? And so now I want to open up the room for kind of a dialogue and discussion for the next uh, 15 minutes that we have about answering these questions or finding out where we're at, where we're at in the world, and and going back to that question I asked, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And how can we create that resilient, desirable future and start living it today and now with resilience and, and some security? So I'm gonna, uh, you're feel free to open up your mic and, and give input if you wanna put in something into the chat window and 
because you don't want to speak on the mic, that is what that's fine as well. Um, or if you just have some other general questions as we guide the discussion through, please let me know. Anybody have a question? Anybody would like to get in on the discussion? Hi, Karina. Hi, Diana. It's good to see you, Gino. Okay, well, if there's no questions, then I would like to go on and kind of give you more of a talk. I, I'm, I'm used to the, the, the difference with an unconference is, um, they're usually more dialogues and discussion. It uh, was a big event, usually uh, derived out of Kinternet Group, um, originally out of Israel, and it's more interaction. And it's not really talking heads and educating or entertaining you. I can do that very well, but I'd like to get you stimulated and thinking about the future and what situation we're in. Um, and, and I guess I can kind of, um, I don't want to do doom and gloom because I have a lot of hope and optimis uh, optimism for the future and where we can go and where this trip is taking us and, and how we're really progressing uh, pretty well, even during this pandemic. Um, but here's a big issue. And so let me, let me kind of uh, set the tone and, and, and uh, that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a United Nations Sustainable Development Goal advocate and an expert with the World Economic Forum and have projects and, and things all around the world and, and deal with a lot of um, philosophies and thought ideas of how the world is going. Working on some projects, one of the projects is uh, uh, with the UN is called the uh, Digital Ecosystem for the Earth. Another one is called Earth School. And um, another one is, is uh, basically Resilience Frontiers. It's what happens after the Sustainable Development Goals are achieved in 2030. Um, what happens after that? And it's a, it's a plan of action from 2030 to 2050 called Resilience Frontiers. And it could be the Resilience Development Goals. And uh, so I, th I think on these big global scales as global citizens for us all and, and, and what the future looks like for us and how we can get there um, all together instead of with major loss and, 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 uh, and issues in our lives. And so I see a lot of people waiting for the next politician. I mean, we can be, because we can use our vote to uh, do that, we can use our dollars as a voting tool. We can use our vote to, to get those right people into office uh, to make those decisions. But what we're seeing is that they're failing us. So the Bolsonaro's in Brazil who are letting the Amazon rainforest burn, the Putins, the Shays, the Duartes, the Erdogan's, the Trumps who are creating the Trumpocracy and and failing us as a world, the, the world's politicians, the world's frameworks and systems are not working for us anymore. So to sit around and wait for um, them to deliver the future for us is something that's really going to be disappointing to us all. And that's why besides voting with your dollars, besides voting with your vote, um, we should take an active part to put our hand on the rudder to steer the future that we want and start living in the future. Now, it's kind of a precarious position to be in because you have to start where you're at. You have to start living in the future. So I, I deal with a lot of futurists. I speak to a, a lot of futurists and people who are entrepreneurs and innovators and uh, surprisingly, most of them are doing well. Their businesses are still operating during this time. They're still 
in a position to help others by producing respirators and, and helping with vaccines and helping with uh, food and, and many other basic needs because they have been living in the future a long time. Their business is structured in such that they've already been oper operating in the digitized world with innovation, with emerging technologies that they have automation and mechanization to help them um, to be where they are or where they need to be. And um, so it's really fabulous to, uh, to be surrounded by those, but I really know a lot of other people who are not prepared at all. They, they're out there scrambling to figure out how to do a Zoom call. They're trying to figure out how to work from home. They're uh, dealing with issues about uh, how do they deal with their children or the kids being home full time now that they've got to be take on the role as an educator, as a teacher, and many things that they're just not prepared to work and live or be in the future. And so it starts with us individually, where we need to have that resilience and that self sustainability first, before we can branch out and help others. And once we have that, then we can really be in a unique position um, to move forward and help others to do what's necessary, but to wait around for politicians, governments and communities to set up the infrastructure that we need today for food, water, resources, energy, and those things is really putting us in a precarious place. And so my, uh, uh, my, my biggest takeaway for you is to get up to speed with our exponentially growing world, live in the now, and live the future that you want to see now for you personally today. Uh, that is so vital to do, and it's so easy to do. So, uh, sure, I got, let me say one more thing before I answer your question. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I can't say your name right, because Mia. <laughs> but, um, Senia. Senia, thank you. Senia. Instead of running out and hoarding toilet paper or resources and, and, um, panicking or having fear, um, it would be good to be self-sustaining and resilient. So whether, whether you live in an apartment, a shanty hut, uh, in a refugee camp, a big house on a ranch, if you're a millionaire, great, I'm happy for you. But you still need to build in that self-sufficiency and resilience that you can uh, function and live tomorrow. So how do you do that? Well, um, most of the stores during the pandemic were open that you could go buy a $5 unit for your toilet and have a bidet instead of going hoarding toilet paper. There's ways to do sprouting in vertical gardens inside of your apartment, inside of your shanty hut. There's uh, ways to do uh, ambient water harvesting. There's ways to uh, be resilient in this time to make sure that you have the basis to build up the future where you truly want to live in. Um, go ahead. I completely agree with you um, in everything that you've said that we personally as individuals need to create the future yeah, that we want to live. As Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. I absolutely agree with you on that. And per personally, you know, I've been trying to um, apply different sustainable practices to my own daily life, as in, you know, trying to be more conscious about my waste, be um, switched to renewable uh, energy company, which provides the electricity, uh, you know, with, in the place I live and everything. But, taking less flights there's loads of loads of instructions that you can uh follow but at the same time i i personally think that even when you apply all of those practices in your daily life and there's loads of us who do who, who, who does it it's still not enough still not enough because real power and real life-changing you know life-changing 
uh, practices which should be taken, uh, they, they should be taken by governments, they should be taken by big corporations, by people who have this real power over, you know, people. And they should be the ones to implement uh, within their businesses, within the design even of their businesses, within, um, you know, to be signed to, I don't I know. I get your point. Can I answer to it? Yes, there's a couple. There's a couple takes on that. So... Um, we've, we've got to wrap up soon because I think the other, uh, speaker is going to join soon or is already here. Is they, are they already here? The other speaker is starting at 17. To answer your question quickly is, so if, if uh, you, you think you're too small to have power, try sleeping in the room with a mosquito. That's the first thing. So it doesn't matter how small you are. Secondly, um, uh, if we're waiting for politicians or, or those in power to take care of that, we're, we're screwed. We're fucked. Because here's the thing. We voted for Trump. He didn't get the popular vote, but he's in power because he got the electoral college vote. We didn't vote for Bolsonaro. It was a what's up thing that voted for him, but people still voted for him. Somehow he got the vote and he's still in power. So now we're waiting for crazies or somebody who's not of our belief to change the system. We're going to be waiting a long time. We're going to be very disappointed in the future. So there's another way to, to, to hack that system. Um, and it's through creating a de decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO. It's by using emerging technologies and innovation. It's by currently these new, these old civilization framework models that we're operating on. They're not functioning for us, but we need to keep them afloat long enough to transition to something new. That something new has has really got to be something that's a trustless system that uses innovation, emerging technologies, regenerative principles of regenerative ag, regenerative principles, period, circular economy principles. It's not about the new product of the future or the new Zoom of the future, the new electric vehicle. It's how we produce in the future that tr that truly matters. So if you produce without harm to human life and human health and environmental health uh, and planetary health, then um, we can live within our safe operating space of planetary boundaries. Um, because of North Korea and, and, and Russia and Putin, China, all the different players in our world, from coming from the United Nations, coming from the World Economic Forum, they're struggling to unite. They're struggling for a unified global voice, but we're a global, we're a global world. Um, what, what's occurring is the decisions and impacts that are happening by Bolsonaro in the, letting the Amazon uh, rainforest burn is not just affecting Brazil, it's affecting the entire world and vice versa. We could say stuff about China or Africa or the US. Those are decisions that are happening regionally or in nations that affect us all over the world. So why we wouldn't play a voice as a global citizen, as a global vote or a global um, uh, universal system where we all have decision making in, uh, in that uh, process. And that's kind of where I'm leading to is how do we, how do we get there? Well, first, it needs to start with yourself so that you're okay, so that you're not struggling, so that you're not looking for a handout, so that you can be resilient and self-sustaining before we go to that next step. It's uh, um, five o'clock, and I believe the next uh, speaker should be starting. Is he or she in the room already? No, yes. Okay, Andre is in the room. I guess she's, uh, he is having some issues. I was. Okay, are you, are you ready to go? No, I'm all fixed up. 
Okay. You're, uh, are you, you're starting the, se uh, the five o'clock session? No. Okay. I'm just watching. Okay. <laughs> Um, is the Came here to watch you mainly. I, I thank you. I appreciate it. We're just finishing. It's at, um, it's supposed to be a new speaker at five o'clock. Is anybody in the room the new speaker? If not, I can keep talking. As you can tell, I am quite the talker. But I was hoping more for a dialogue. Does anybody have any more questions or things that they would like to know or ask? Andre, by the way, is my good friend from Malta, who just barely started going to school. How old are you, Andre? I'm now 12. 12. Last okay. time we met, I was 11.10. Uh, 11.10. 11, and how, how's your new school doing? Good. good. Very innovative. Good, good. We met at the Malta Innovation Summit and Andre got up on stage and talked and he's a very special young man. Nick, are was you just a great experience, new, especially new speaker you. for the room? I am not, Mark. I'm sorry. Okay. I just uh, wanted to ask you something. First, yeah, please, first thank you for your contribution so far. Um, um, you triggered me with uh, the DAO, with the Decentralized Autonomous Organization model, which is I think slowly being tested uh, from the maker DAO to, to new forms. Um, mm -hmm. How does it um, um, affect your uh, line of work or where do you see the DAO going, going for, for initiatives here where you involved in? I believe that we need a, a, a global DAO. So um, that uh, we need to have many, many DAOs created. And uh, there are some platforms out there that are really fabulous to use. And uh, we need to get a, a decentralized uh, away from uh, these current structures. And so we need some new models. And right now, those are some really emerging models that work well for us. And so if you have an idea that's a game changing, regional changing, na national changing, that you should look into that uh, as a, a form of moving towards a trustless system. So the problem is with uh, humanity in general, it, and it's really hard to get into all of this in 30 minutes. And that's why I kind of only just tickle the surface of, of some of these things is we're fallible. We make mistakes. We have different cultures and opinions. We're struggling to unify each other, but we're all homo sapiens. We're all the same species. We come from the hominid tribes. There are eight other hominids that live before us. They're just like us. They had families, monies, tools. They lived together. They're not here anymore. We're lucky enough to be here. But even closer to that, that, that we're not aware of, is that there's 12 civilizations, civilization frameworks, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, the Romans, the Greeks. They're all civilizations that have collapsed. They don't exist anymore. They're gone. All we see is the ruins. And all but two of those civilizations that are not here anymore, they all collapse because of environmental or ecological collapse. And the, two, the other two that didn't was because of um, conflict, disruption, war, some kind of other type of a collapse. And um, the current framework that we're feeling globally, this civilization framework that we have, it's not working for all of us. It's very broken. It's very nationalistic. It's creating all sorts of, uh, of issues. And we're actually unified as humans. Um, uh, I know people in the same, uh, in Germany that are married to uh, Russian and Americans. And I know people who are in China married to Japanese and uh, someone from Brazil. And we are a global citizens and global world and the decisions that are made in one spot are made in another. So we need more of these DAOs, trustless systems based on smart contracts, 
based on distributed ledger technologies that move us into a system of a trustless system where we're not saying, hey, I think I can trust Mark because he looks like Moses. He's got long hair and a beard. And he looks good. I think oh, I'll trust him. He looks like a prophet. Instead, no, it's a distributed ledger technology. It's a trustless system that is secure, um, decentralized, um, that we can say, hey, no, I don't have to see if that's the right bank to put my money in. That's the right place to do that. That, it's a, that takes that process away from us. Also, that corruption process of how votes occur, how identification occurs, how food uh, is transported, all those things out of it. And so I think that's why the Dow direction is, is a step in the right direction to take it out of our hands into a system that's kind of a trustless system and a unified global system for us to use. Is the other speaker in the room yet? Or is there no other speaker? I just don't want to steal anybody else's time because I can continue talking. I actually have content for hours. Mark, I think you have a time. I think there's no speaker after you. Okay, great. Well, that's even better. So is there, did I answer your question, Nick, or do you have another question? No, I, uh, you, you answered uh, perfect. Uh, thank you. I mean, do, are you currently using a, a DAO or do you know of uh, any good tools that you want to recommend? Um, I'm currently uh, in a research phase, how I can uh, create a place where people can create their own DAOs in Amsterdam. So I'm looking, for example, uh, at the DAO house in, uh, in Berlin. Uh -huh. um, uh, I've closely watched the, the, the maker DAO and, and how they, yeah, come very far and then they got hacked. And, uh, and I think they, yeah. we, we all could learn from that. Um, there's a, a thing called that allow, uh, in, um, in the U S which is a decentralized, uh, investment bank model. So it's a for-profit model, but I do think with this incentive, it might drive, uh, uh, just the, the mechanics of this uh, um, this DAO model in 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 combination with open law and so the, a law for that that is actually open uh, to actually a working model that uh, will make it closer. So I think all these small DAOs will um, show progress, and we can take the best uh, learnings from each DAO to you know, scale up. I think the DAO structure for bigger challenges. Um, but currently, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to start, start small here, and uh, I'm very um, impressed by uh, Aragon, how, how far they are yeah. uh, doing their works with the, with the court and such. I like uh, uh, Dow Stack. I like Aragon quite a bit. I, I think uh, Aragon is really nice, and it's easy for those who aren't super tech savvy to, to make a, an entry into that. Um, there's a couple of things when it comes to emerging technologies that really stick out for me the most is, um, yeah, they're supposed to be able to give us something that's, I don't like to say blockchain, I would say distributed ledger technology, but even blockchain, cryptocurrencies, tokenization, if we get into uh, smart contracts, if we get into AI and emerging technology is supposed to really add a different layer and help us give us security and hopefully create a, a secure, trustless system where you're not spending all your time with the middleman, but also saying, is that someone that I can trust to give my money to, to transport my food or whatever it may be? Um, we, we need that type of help uh, as humanity to, to unify us globally. If you saw um, how the, just the United Nation operates and works, you would be you would pass out because you'd say they're so disorganized, they need reform, they couldn't find their ass with both hands because they're such a mess. And But yet everybody's looking to them for help. And so uh, we need some, some technology help to get us up to speed with our exponentially growing world. Our world is growing good, bad, and ugly exponential, but it doesn't just have to be the negative side of that. 
we can use the exponential function for good and then we in the, the the way that we apply those technologies to get up to speed um, with our fast growing world and um, that that's why I really like those DAOs. But as you say, there's been some hacks. There's been some issues. I mean, there's even with Ethereum. That's why they've been that. Karina, you have a question? I just saw your camera go yeah. on. Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, as always, uh, having a mind blowing experience with uh, your speech. Um, I'm since uh, my academic field has been much on the application of hard security measures on environmental protection and water security. Uh, some questions that uh, arises when I listen to you, especially in terms of protecting the Amazon is the law enforcement and the role of governments in actually protecting the environment. Uh, uh, it, it's a bit frustrating uh, to, uh, to see the, the speed of bureaucracy and so on, but it's also part of the stability because they have the monopoly of arms and weapon control and so on. So there's a, there's a little of balance there. Um, but how, how do you see uh, this going forward, the role of governments in protecting uh, the, uh, the environment, let's say the Amazon, where you have tribes and cartels, and it's very difficult to protect the people on the field. This is one of the, the most complicated issues with humanitarian assistance, is that how do you protect those protecting the others? And uh, what is your perspective on, on, on this uh, issue? <laughs> thank you for that so boy boy that's such an easy question to answer <laughs> thank you i appreciate it no um it, uh, it's again it's it's a, it's very complex so one thing that occurred in in 2018 just for your information is that all international organizations they switched from a siloed so whether it's the world economic forum the w uh, world trade organization or the united nations they all switched from a siloed approach to solving our global grand challenge to a systems view or systems dynamic view approach at solving our global grand challenges because they've realized when you just go in to address poverty or water or or um corruption or whatever whatever the issue is that you're never going to solve the problem completely. You really have to have a dynamic systems view approach to solve these, these global grand challenges. And so um, we need to think global, but really act local and regional for the cultures, for those people who are living in the refugee camps, those people who are dealing with bureaucracy and corruption and, and uh, that it doesn't make it from the dictator or the political government to the the camps or the fields or the people that are living in those areas um and what back i i don't know if you missed it but back what i was speaking about is um uh w when when we first started was that the system's not only live not working for everybody but we're not living in the future we're kind of waiting for the future to happen to us we're waiting for uh politicians and governments and regions to to act upon us and bring us the infrastructure or the things that we need um but they've been failing us for years they they're not delivering on those things and that's because they're disorganized because they don't have these emerging technologies because they don't have the systems to to help them to disperse that and i'm going to give you an example of that on on, on what i mean so um if if you're an, uh, i deal a lot with innov innovators and entrepreneurs and also uh, uh, locals and city governments if they go to the government to uh, get funding for an infrastructural project or for a business or for something that they want to do first of all they're going to someone else to do it but the minute they get there here's the problem that they're faced with well does it fall under the department or the ministry of agriculture does it 
the fall under the Department of Energy? Does it fall under the Department of, of uh, eco Economy or Business? Does it fall under, you know, technology? What department, what ministry is covering that? And that's still that siloed incremental approach. And so then you get, finally you say, oh, well, it belongs to agriculture. And then you realize, yeah, but it's, it, that's just one facet of that complete system actually has to do with the infrastructure and that. Yeah. So about five years ago, 2015, not only um, uh, did we have the Paris Agreement, these wonderful things, but a lot of businesses switched to this platform type of business model, which is an infrastructural business model. And platform business models means that you don't just focus on the product and let somebody else produce it for you and, and let somebody else market it for you, but you focus on this entire system of that platform. You become an infrastructure. And so now, um, for example, I had a great, I, I have a great company. It's called the Lojas Eco Center and it, it, it's a, multifaceted system but if i were to go get help or go to one of these locations they'd say oh no that's agriculture oh no that's energy oh no yeah. that's and so right there the whole system breaks down the best example is the top 10 uh, uh, uh market cap companies in our world the top 10 biggest companies in our world they're all running an infrastructural platform business model system. Uh, it's a, a dynamic model. It's very complex, but it covers the full thing. And I'm going to give you one example. Tesla. Tesla is not just Tesla. And I, it's probably not even fair to say Tesla. It's better to say Elon Musk because I'm going to tell you how this infrastructure goes. SpaceX, Tesla, batteries, bank, insurance company, Hydroloop, um, Neural Netlink, what, what other ones, I'm, Solar City, what other ones am I forgetting? And the, the umbrella over that is, is a sustainable future, is in a, a, a good for our environment type of business. But each one of those are kind of separate. But if you look at them, they're all connected together in a platform and infrastructure for a resilient, desirable future, for sustainable futures. How do we have the technologies, the AI, the computing power, and the emerging technologies, those, that, that infrastructure in place so that we can reach that? And so now I, I, I'm, I think I just tickled the, the answer of your question. I not a big fan of bureaucracy or governments. I think they're failing us all. And I cannot think of uh, very many good examples that are really saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to move. I know you're from Sweden. So I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to move to Sweden. They have the best infrastructure and government and system in place. But uh, we need a global worldwide system. And if we can do that with with emerging technologies, get everybody on the same equality playing field, and then let those fallible politicians, we can still have politicians, but have them use a DAO, have them use an emerging technology that secures, trustworthy, regulates, their, the corruption can't get in there, and that it's uniform for the world so that when the decisions are made in Sweden or the decisions are made in the US, that, um, they're good for the whole planet and not just for Sweden. You know what I mean? Yes. And so I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I mean, that's you, a, that you did. You, you did. didn't give me an easy <laughs> one to answer. I'll tell you. But you're the right person to ask complex questions to. And actually, uh, when you were speaking about uh, Elon Musk uh, and uh, connecting it to security, I think that uh, one thing that has uh, changed and shifted the, the past 50 years has been that the military before was the provider of security, was the, the, the source of innovation and technologies and that we in civil society and uh, civilians are using today. But Elon Musk has been the disruptor of this in, in the SpaceX and you see the the entrepreneurs and the innovators now creating a field of security that what we know of in military 
uh, in the military field is that they're more, much more advanced. And then becomes the role of the private sector and private security and so on. But that's a uh, that's well, for a can coffee. Can I put, <laughs> put that into perspective because I also touched on that as well. Yeah. Those people uh, are those leaders, those innovators, those entrepreneurs that uh, have been talking about the future and, and working on platform business models and have a clear vision of where we need to go to in the future. They are already applying that. So by 2024, uh, Starlink broadband, that's one that I forgot for Elon Musk. There's gonna be one global SIM card for uh, around the world, you're gonna have telephone and internet connection through one global uh, SIM called Starlink broadband network. But those, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, um, uh, Facebook, Google, they're still in operation. They're still in business. They're thriving more than ever. Um, there are some caveats to that. I don't think they're the biggest and best examples. I, I'm, I'm very critical of, of them. But what they, they didn't say, we want to make the entire automotive industry go away. Or if they are a vegan, they didn't say, we want to make the entire meat industry go away. They wanted to go in and we call it disruption, but they wanted to go in and disrupt those industries. But really what they wanted to do is to show them the new way to operate, show them a better way of doing it and, and kind of advance that technology so that they start operating more efficiently instead of outdated old technologies. When I first started out my talk today, I spoke on Bertrand Picard and the solar impulse. I, I'm going to be flying in airplanes for the rest of my life, I have family and businesses and things all over the world. So I'm always gonna fly. I would love it if we could fly that it doesn't affect human suffering or our environment in that process. And I'm very determined and believe that there's a future, and I know, so 2024, what is it? Ilium uh, taxi, five passenger taxi jets will be approved to start flying. They're totally carbon neutral. They're, they're not hurting the environment. It's like a, a drone taxi for five people. So that's one example. Now, e let me give you the example for Elon Musk. So right now, he, most of his factories continued to operate during the pandemic because they're automated, they're mechanized. He's operating in the future and there's social distancing. People aren't working tight together on an assembly line. There's one person distance from another working on a big assembly line. And so he kept those in operation. Same with Jeff Bezos. But let me, let me give you the caveat. California specifically, two of those facilities were up and running. Um, uh, the minute the governor says, okay, we're ready to go, but one facility he couldn't put up an operation because the local representative said no. And it's a very delicate subject because are you putting people in danger by sending them to work, right? Uh, early without making sure there's the social distancing. Well, that's not, that's not a problem with Elon Musk and the way he operates. He's not putting people in danger. He's put, he, he's, delivering the respirators and doing that. Yeah, he's a little bit um, mean the way he talks about it or the way he goes about it. It's kind of social media craziness. But I think that if we, we put it into perspective, he's trying to catapult us, get us into the future. May I think it's May 24th or 25th, the first uh, man-spaced uh, travel from SpaceX is gonna happen. So. Uh, 51 years later, we're finally putting some people back in uh, on a private thing. So what he did is went in and um, not disrupted, but privatized those things. And that's what the governments need. They need many DAOs and privatization to help them to make that curve, because right now they're really struggling to get that uh, um, infrastructure in place. There's too many uh, too much bureaucracy, too much paperwork. I mean, we haven't even made the digital trans, transfer, uh, transition. We're still filling out paperwork and hand and typewritten documents in, in many places in the world. It's just insanity. And, and, and in that process that, you know, that 
I, I don't don't get me wrong. I, I'm just a tree, big a tree hugger and environmentalist as maybe you are, but I'm also a techno lust techno nerd. I believe that um, we need to get up to speed with our exponentially growing world with innovation and technology, but we need to do it in a healthy way so that so that it can work for us all and not we working for them. And it's a better efficient business model. It's a better operating system for our world that brings sustainability up, that reduces carbon emissions. It's just all around better than some of the, the inefficient systems that we've been operating on that could reduce our emissions, our greenhouse gases, and the way we operate for the future. So. Is the next speaker in the room or should are they gonna talk for another 30 minutes? Andre, do you have a question? No, but you know what? You did remind me about one thing. Okay. Speaking about climate change and technology mm -hmm. and the COVID-19 pandemic, you mm -hmm. reminded me this COVID-19 is actually beneficial to the environment because people are using less cars. It's already gone down by like 2% in Malta and the climate change is really affecting us because we're in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's boiling right now, but not as bad as last summer because obviously since the emissions are down, everything's getting a bit better. Thank you, I appreciate that glad for your input and uh, so I can know what's going on in Malta. But we're still not the lucky, but we're still uh, unlucky. We're still, we're still unlucky, yeah. We're, we're still, all unlucky, but compared we've still to got countries a lot of work like to do. Yeah. Perfect. So one thing that we're seeing with the COVID in this pandemic is um, that it's really, uh, there's a lot of interlinkages with climate change. There's a lot of interlinkages with food. So don't, um, don't be mistaken, don't be baffled. It's not the oil, coal and gas industry, the automotive industry that's the biggest uh, cause of uh, human suffering or envi environmental climate change, greenhouse gases. It's actually the agriculture, seafood, food and beverage industry is the number one uh, industries that are affecting our climate and our environment. And I want to tell you that because a lot of people think, you know, uh, we're talking about Elon Musk, we're talking about renewable energy, we're talking about energy when we talk about um, uh, coal, fossil fuels, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, oil, coal, and gas. But what we're talking about is energy and what's the basic energy source in our world? It's food. It's what every human being needs three times a day. It fuels our body and that's what fuels our world. And um, if we get that right, if we globally reform food, if we get that onto the right place where it needs to be so that it doesn't impact human health with obesity, malnutrition, uh, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that we don't have 30% food waste, which is actually an exponential waste, where we figure out that all the transportation and logistics are, are fueling the fossil fuel industry because they haven't transitioned to renewables or other methods, that, that it is the biggest impact just to feed us humans. And so to say, no, it's politics, to say it's, it's this, it's all of those together in a system, but it really starts with the basis of our energy source, the caloric intake, the food that we take in each and every day to ourselves. And during this time of the, the pandemic, what, what has been seen is, you know, everybody was like so controversial about the Brexit, right? Well, um, did you know that between 200,000 and 600,000 migrant harvesters go into the United Kingdom every year to harvest their food and then go back to their country? Because those migrant workers couldn't go because of COVID and because of the Brexit, nobody harvests that food. And you know what happened? They dug mass graves, 
buried that food, which has created methane, it's created waste, it's created a whole nother effect. And it's a crying shame that we're burying and wasting food. It's not just the United Kingdom, it's happening all over the world because there's no harvesters. Well, if, if, if we had gotten up to speed with emerging technologies, automation, mechanization, maybe we would still not, we wouldn't have that in food insecurity. Maybe if we were up to speed with our time, 2020, we would have some easing in this issues. And that's why we really need to think about how to do the future now instead of waiting for someone to have it happen to us. Because these, these political decisions we make in these votes, we don't understand the long-term effects of what's going on. So um, is the next speaker in the room is supposed to start now, 1730? No? Now I could talk all day. I should, if I would have known that, I would have just kept going. Does anybody have any more questions? Because I'll just keep going. <laughs>